Okay, hello everyone. Welcome. Um, uh, welcome, welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce Matt Zeiler here, um, co-founder and CEO of Clarify. Uh, we are going to have an amazing speech here for powering the enterprise with computer vision. And with that, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Matt. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll dive right in. So I'm going to walk you through uh, to start a little bit about us and uh, really thinking about the AI life cycle and how we address that for our customers. And so I founded the company almost uh, seven years ago after doing my PhD on this field of understanding uh, images and video with artificial intelligence. I was very fortunate to work with some of the pioneers in AI like Jeff Hinton and Yan LeCun, uh, as well as Jeff Dean during a couple internships at uh, Google Brain. And I uh, started the company after that and ended up winning ImageNet based on our very first models. Uh, we ended up winning the top five places in image classification and hired the person who uh, won the detection uh entries as well so uh from the start we really kicked off with world-class image recognition uh, and i've extended it to video and even natural language processing now uh, and we've accumulated a really strong research team with over 140,000 citations in different scientific fields and we're headquartered in new york uh, based on my location but we have offices outside of washington uh, san francisco and Tallinn, estonia uh, and we've been backed by some really great uh, investors, Google, NVIDIA, Qualcomm in our seed round, USV Leopard Series A, Menlo led our Series B, and Lux Capital has been a part of both. And I think our one of our biggest achievements was most recently in November, Forrester named us a leader in the computer vision platform report. We're the only startup in the leadership position next to trillion dollar companies, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. And it's really uh, what we hear from customers as well. We've separated ourselves from other startups because building a full uh, AI platform that caters to the entire life cycle is really difficult at this point. Um, and we have a lot of uh, big success going up against the big guys as well. And so what the different challenges that we typically hear from enterprises and we help address are these three things. They're siloed teams, they need more profit, or they lack expertise. In terms of the siloed teams, there's a lot of AI efforts happening, but they're going on in different parts of an organization. And they're not really getting the value out of those, and they don't really have management visibility and accountability across those teams, and coordination is really slow. So that's a big uh, issue, and, and kind of uh, adopting a platform that all those teams can use solves that in a big way. And that helps address the second issue. Once you have a common platform, you can really drive profit and productivity much faster. Um, you can optimize things a lot better and you get the most out of the data that is important to your business. That's really the differentiator that you have in your business. It's the data, it's your actual products, it's not AI. So adopt a platform to help you get the most out of the things that are differentiators in your business. And then there's a lack of expertise. There's not a common understanding of what AI can do for your business. People are doing a lot of the work right now if you haven't adopted AI, so they're unproductive. You're spending a lot of money on that. Um, and it's not really uh, a center of, of excellence and innovation and any form of differentiation for you. So that's where uh, getting AI to solve your problems can really uh, improve these areas. And we do that through our platform. And I like to show it in this way because it really walks you through the end-to-end -end AI lifecycle, which always starts with your data. It could be your images, video, or text when using the Clarify platform. And it comes in um, unlabeled in, in most scenarios. And the very first thing you need to do is to be able to annotate that data so that AI can learn from it uh, about the things that you care about. And we've built a, a labeler product. We just launched it last week, actually, uh, brand new, uh, meant for scaling up the annotation process with large human workforce and lots of automation using AI so that humans aren't doing majority of the work. Now, all that data gets indexed for search. And this is important because as your data sets grow, you're gonna wanna slice and dice the relevant parts to feed into the training process. And we support searching by the human annotated data, searching by the predictions of AI models, and even doing similarity search, like finding stuff that looks similar to a given image. So that becomes the input to uh, training. This is the data that's important. And the other input is the algorithm you wanna learn from. 
And this is where our research team works with, with the research community to make sure we have state-of-the-art algorithms for you to train on top of. So those two things go into training a model. Every time you train a model, it actually gets versioned. And this is really important. It's just like software development. You want to make a change, commit it, and run that in production while you're developing the next several changes. That's the same thing with AI development. And when you push it to production, you deploy your model, that's where you're given a choice. You want to run it in our fully hosted cloud. You don't have to think about machines. You could run it fully uh, bare metal on your own servers, and then even push it out to edge devices like iOS, Android, and IoT devices. And that's when you start sending in real world data for your use case and getting the outputs from the models and doing whatever your use case might be on top of that. Now this arrow coming back is an important one as well. It's actually built into our platform, has the ability to siphon off data from your real world predictions to help improve future versions of your model. And this is done by treating the confident uh, predictions as kind of ground truth annotations while sending uh, the non-confident stuff to humans to review. And it's all seamlessly integrated. All these different things are one platform, uh, which is a huge advantage. Um, and it's part of this entire ecosystem. All those building blocks in the AI lifecycle manifest themselves as both user interfaces, which we call portal, and APIs, so that you can run at production scale and connect to any of the tools that you're using in your business. Um, the AI fabric is the notion that this whole ecosystem runs wherever you need it to. We can run on Azure, AWS, or GCP. We can run on bare metal and even push things out to the edge. And then finally, services help uh, bridge the gap for some of the data labeling, model building that you might not want to take on yourself. And so let me show you what this looks like and what uh, the end results of using a platform like this to build world-class AI uh, looks like. And to start, I'm going to show you some of our pre-built models. So these are the result of us labeling a lot of data, millions of uh, examples, and training models for different use cases that we see uh, to be commonly recurring. And the first model I'll show you, this is right on our website, so you can check out all these models yourself. But I'll start with a general model. This is general purpose in the sense that if you take your phone out of your pocket and take a picture, it should tell you something meaningful. So social media, consumer photos, that kind of use case um, is uh, solvable with this model. And we recognize objects like water and boat, but also descriptive words like reflection, and we give a confidence back for every one of them. This model recognizes 11,000 different things, and even these really high-level things like affection, togetherness, or love can be understood. When you apply it to a video, this is uploading the video from my laptop to our API, and we respond back in just a several seconds. This was a three-minute video that we understood in about five seconds. So orders of magnitude faster than real time, and what we respond with is much more detail than a human would respond with. So here I isolated just the line for mountain and the height of the line is how confident mountain appears in the images or videos. Um, and so as I jump around, you can see different things become more likely at this part of the video, like snow and lake, uh, because it was a, a snowy mountain in front of a lake. Uh, and so that's how fast and, and accurate we can understand video and images with our general model. Now let's take a look at some of these other models. So a big part of our business is uh, moderating out content, images, and text um, to recognize nudity, drugs, weapons, uh, or hate speech, uh, threatening speech, et cetera, in the form of text. We have other classifiers for food, wedding, travel. We have a bunch of face models. So in the case of uh, this model, it's a face model, so it detects where the face is and then classifies some attributes of it. Uh, in this case, age, gender, and multicultural appearance are recognized, uh, again, with those confidence scores, which help with thresholding. Here, we're seeing um, object detection uh, instead of just face detection, and uh, it's putting a bounding box around every object, and in this case, it's trained to recognize apparel objects. So it says dress, even the small bracelet on her wrist, and her pair of shoes. So in the fashion industry, this type of uh, classifier can really be powerful. So these are all off the shelf and literally in minutes, you sign up for a Clarify account, you have access to these, you can start sending in images or video and you get these types of predictions back on them. Now, the exciting thing is when you start building these models yourself on your own data and uh, recognizing what you care about. And so I'll walk you through that process now. When you sign up for Clarify, you're gonna be dropped into 
um, uh, an account like this. This is my account. I have a bunch of different uh, apps in here, trying out different ideas. Uh, apps are essentially like projects. And so I have an app for my personal pictures that I'll walk you through. Now, one of the important things about using a, a platform in a large organization is security and control. Um, so here I can create API keys that give permissions for any of the different operations that we have in our platform. And that's kind of the basic level, but if you go to advanced, you can literally control every single endpoint in our API. And this is really powerful because I can put this API key in a front end user interface and not worry about people deleting my data or training models that are expensive. Uh, I might just want them to do predictions or searches as an example. The same story goes when you invite other people to work on a project together. You get to control as the app owner what permissions those people have. For every individual, you can control all the way down to those API endpoints. So it's much finer grained permission control than uh, any of our competitors. And this is kind of the app details page, lets you set up those types of things, lets you look at all the models and how much data you have in your app. But Explorer is the next mode. And you can see we have a bunch of different modes uh, on the left-hand side here. So Explorer lets you explore your data. And that primarily is built around search. So here I typed in searching for grass in my personal pictures. I didn't have to manually tag anything in here. We're finding grass automatically. And you can see there's a bunch of golf courses, uh, this dog, etc. And if I search with a little icon on any image, it's actually going to use now that image as the query to find stuff that looks visually similar. And it should find itself, but then it finds a bunch of other stuff that looks very similar uh, to the query image. And this is really important because I didn't have to think about different keywords uh, or combinations of them to find these results. I just used a picture. So this could be to find a, a vehicle or a product or a person that you might have seen before and you just don't know what they're called. Now, search, as I mentioned earlier, is really important for training. So I can find things with search that I want to label to train my model. So here uh, in my personal pictures, if I search for pet, I see pictures of my dog. And I want to teach the system how to recognize my dog and call him by name. And so I'm going to grab those first three pictures. And down here, I'm going to label them uh, by his name. His name is Rolly. I've done this demo before, so his name is in here. I could type in any new thing in here, um, and it would learn on the fly. I'm just going to check this box, which conveniently creates a model when I hit Enter. So on the left, that model was created, and it has the concept of Rolly within it. Now, to learn from these pictures, I have to put that model through the training process. And it's very simply a button here. I hit train the model. And this is a process that typically takes weeks of time and requires orders of magnitude more data than what you just saw. Here we trained it in literally a second. And we're seeing predictions on the right-hand side that is 100% confident that this is Rolly. So it learned this brand new concept um, out, of, out of the blue from these three pictures. And it's very confident. And for these first three pictures, it should be confident because that was the training data. But if I try an example like this, which is clearly not Rolly, it should be pretty good already at saying it's not Rolly. If it was more confused, I could treat it that as a negative and retrain the model. And this will, uh, again, take a few seconds, and then it'll update its predictions to uh, be even more definitive that this is not Rolly. So that's how simple it is to train AI in Clarify's platform. Now, this thing that I just taught it, Rolly, is immediately searchable. And this is technology we ended up patenting. Uh, we haven't seen any, anybody able to do this. Uh, and it has huge implications. So for example, if I'm an analyst and I'm wanting to teach the system something new, but I'm processing like billions of things, I can teach it something and query those billions of things without having to re-index my data. And I can have many analysts in the same application doing the same thing. Um, this is really, really powerful. Another use case of this is for recommendation systems. If instead of an object like Rolly being trained, we train the preferences of a user into the platform. So maybe it's using click-through data on the web. They like something, they don't like something. That's kind of the positive and negative examples of their preference. So we train their preference, and then we can immediately search through, say, a product catalog to find things that that user might like. That happens in a fraction of a second. So it enables much different recommendation systems than are typically built out of a history of data you can learn on the fly. And this applies to faces as well. So let me show you an app that has screenshots out of movies. 
And when you configure the app to have face recognition, it actually finds all the faces automatically for you. I didn't have to draw these bounding boxes. I could draw additional boxes if I need to, but our face detector is now very accurate. So it takes away a lot of that work. And then I can label each of these boxes by uh, whatever names I care about. And I've done that already and trained a model, just like Rolly, same process. And now I can search for Bill Murray as an example. And because it's a detection model, finding the faces, it's actually showing you in the search results which of the faces in these pictures Bill Murray was matched with. So this is a really powerful insight and allows you to do a lot of customization uh, with, with face recognition. This also applies to object recognition. So here is a scenario, and this is kind of an exciting uh, thing to watch. So you, you're seeing now um, on the right-hand side, this wheel is spinning. So what's happening is we've trained a model for object detection. And right now it's actually automatically scaling this model up um, this model was actually scaled down to zero replicas, and there uh, was no need to have it up, you know, wasting resources. And now that it's scaled up, as I go to these next few images, you can see their predictions come back instantaneously. So this is a huge pain point we're solving for both research and engineering teams in our customers. Uh, one of the common things that they tell us is that they have their, their data science teams uh, building models, but then they have to shove them over a fence to the engineering team and the infrastructure and DevOps team, different in every organization. It's some core engineering team that has to figure out how to make this research project production quality. So they end up rewriting a lot of stuff and then they're responsible for running this thing 24 seven. Whereas in Clarify, those data science members, they just focus on building great models. They don't have to think about deployment ever again. Nobody does. It's automatically scaling for you and if you send in more traffic, um, typically through the API, the UI is good for training the model. The API is where you run things at production volume. Then it's going to automatically scale this, not just to have one replica like is uh, powering this uh, user interface right now. It'll automatically scale to as much replicas as you need to handle your volume. You never have to think about the DevOps side of AI ever again. So that's an example of object detection. Here's an example where we take the same principles we built for computer vision and apply it to natural language processing. So this example is sending in, uh, as training data, abstracts from archive research papers. And they're all different genres. And so they've been labeled on the right-hand side to show finance, statistics, et cetera. And then a model has been trained to classify these things. And so now we can find things that are 100% likely to be financed in this example. And if you skim through here, it's talking about government bonds and inflation. So this is actually a, a correct prediction. Uh, so that's how simple it is to build topic models or sentiment analysis. Let's say these are user reviews. You want to say it's a positive review or a five-star review versus a one-star review. Um, all that is now customizable uh, by instead of sending images, sending text. Uh, so in the same platform, you can actually handle multiple different data types uh, that are important to your business. And then the final thing I'll show is uh, is pretty complex. I don't know if I have a slide for it, uh, unfortunately. Um, let me just jump to a different uh, slide back here. So the idea of that arrow coming back and understanding your production traffic to automatically improve your models. So this is. Um, the idea of collecting data and then automatically annotating it. So the collection is done um, through workflows. And workflows are very simply in our platform, just a, a graph of models. So here we're running the general model. And then uh, the idea behind collectors is collecting from a model's predictions uh, any configurable uh, amount of data from it. And so we have building blocks in our workflows for things like sampling. So uh, we get lots of traffic to our general model. We just want to get to put 10% of it. Um, here we have the ability to map between different vocabularies. So our general model might call uh, something a dog, but that might mean something different to somebody else. And so we have to be able to map from the vocabulary of that model to a different vocabulary to make it flexible enough in general. So we have that capability built in, again, as another building block. And then we have thresholding. So we maybe we want to just collect things that are they're somewhat confident that it's a cat or a dog. That'll add, uh, that'll run through the workflow and add that to my app. So that's one example of collecting data automatically into your app. 
The second part of uh, active learning is to be able to take the data that's added to an app and automatically annotate it. So we call this our an auto annotation workflows. And again, you can run any model that's all configurable. Uh, maybe you do knowledge graph mapping, maybe you don't. Um, and then here, we're going to want to send the things that we're not confident about, or the model's not confident about, to uh, humans to review. So things that are kind of in between thresholds, we're going to send that to a worker named Yang and uh, send the status to pending. And then down here, things that are very confident that it's a cat or dog, we're probably just going to trust that model. It's accurate enough, so we're going to mark it as if I did the work and mark it as success. So that's how you can build uh, active learning directly into our platform. And you can do that all um, in this model mode where you can create a bunch of different types of models. We have tons of them here, for example, is that concept thresholding model. And if I look at uh, this app, it has a couple of different concepts. I can configure thresholds here and the operation. Let's say I want it to be greater than those thresholds. So that'll let any concepts coming in that are bongos or cars greater than 0.6 or 0.7 to pass through. And so that's how simple it is to build one of those building blocks in, uh, in that workflow. And then you can create a workflow out of all these different models that you have. So I might add a bunch of different models to this workflow, and then I can chain them together. Uh, so I can take the input of this uh, node uh, to this model and make it an arbitrary graph out of that. So that's how simple it is to do really powerful things like active learning and automating uh, the human annotation process with uh, a pretty simple UI to configure our APIs. And again, as you use this at production scale, you get all those benefits um, to, to really scale it up. And so I'll just wrap up uh, giving you some examples of uh, some of our use cases. I'm not sure why the slides disappeared. Uh, that's really weird. Um, same slides here. So here's an example of some of the use cases that we solve for customers uh, that fit into those three buckets, moderating content like nudity, um, finding content using an image that's usually applied to product recommendation uh, or catalog uh, recognition. We do a lot of stuff in the physical world from drones, satellite imagery and security cameras. Uh, that could be used for security and monitoring, uh, for quality control, employee safety, and then even uh, things like brand safety, uh, how things can affect your brand negatively. And so we applied this uh, platform across tons of different uh, verticals and use cases like those. Um, that's super frustrating. Uh, you can see here some example customers of ours in lots of different verticals have been leveraging us over the last several years to really scale up their efficiency and uh, get AI to, to lead their innovation in their organization. Uh, we've even built uh, in a kind of timely fashion right now, some ability to help out businesses with COVID-19, recognizing PPE, social distancing, hand washing, even counting people in your uh, buildings. So I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to email me with any questions or follow up that you have from my talk. Take care. If there's chat questions, let me just check. Okay, I think there's a few questions in here. So um, first question is how I look exactly like my picture. Uh, I actually noticed that when it came up. Uh, it's kind of funny. I like to wear my Clarify t-shirt uh, every day. Uh, I have multiple of them. So uh, that's probably why it looks very similar. Uh, the next question is around data bias and face recognition. So we take a lot of uh, care at making sure that our algorithms, not just for face recognition, but in general, have really balanced data sets because the data is what the model is going to learn from. And so for faces, uh, that's over age, that's over gender, that's over ethnicity. We want to make sure that we are accurate at all different uh, buckets. Uh, and so it requires our in-house labeling teams who use our labeler product uh, to really uh, uh, make sure that during the labeling process, we have examples of all different categories that we care about. And the same thing applies to objects. We want to make sure our uh, models are accurate across all the different types of moderation categories, for example, or uh, product categories or apparel categories. Um, so we have a lot of uh, rigorous standards around that. 
And in our platform, you can actually, um, let me pull up this one. When you go into looking at uh, the model versions, we have built-in evaluation metrics. And this is really important for understanding how well you're doing. So in this text classification uh, app, you can see which categories are being confused. So finance and statistics are often confused, which makes sense. Chemistry and physics often confused. Um, other things, much less so. The ideal uh, classifier would be a perfect identity matrix here. Um, so that can really help us diagnose problems. And you can see all the data is in the table around false positives, true positive, et cetera. And this data changes as you change your operating threshold. So we have all the tools built into our platform to help uh, eliminate bias and other uh, data distribution problems. Um, uh, there's a question around cloud only. I think I captured that. Uh, we'd run anywhere you need to. We can run bare metal, even air-gapped environments. So with our work in the DOD and Intel community, we're running on servers that have no connection to the internet. Um, and this can even run on mobile devices uh, and it can even run on the mobile device disconnected from the internet. Um, so that is uh, a huge advantage in, uh, in helping our customers. Um, I think I answered uh, several follow-ups on that. Ah, so object detections, I think I covered that. Uh, I'll show you a few kind of interesting uh, new applications here. Um, so here is some object detection of people, but there we go. So, uh, but it also has tracking as well. So this is something our research team has developed to not just detect where people are, but uh, track where they're going. Uh, and this applies to any object category, it could be vehicles or whatever. Um, so here you saw 839 walking down the aisle. We don't know her name, uh, we might not care. Uh, if we had face recognition, we could tie the two technologies together, tracking and face recognition, if you did have a database of their ID. Uh, but in this demo, it's just saying that this person we think is walking along this path. So you could you know, plan your store better, um, see if people are looking at these ads at all, um, see if somebody stole something uh, from your store, where did they go? So tracking is a really powerful capability we have now, um, and you'll see that built into our, our platform. Um, and then finally, there's a question on uh, tech stack. Uh, so everything, our, the way we can deploy everything together is it's powered uh, by Kubernetes. So all of our um, platform is built in microservices. We wrap it up in a Kubernetes cluster, including the UI. We can drop it into your uh, servers and make it really easy for you to, uh, to run in your own cluster. Um, so that 